You're listening to the BBM Global Network with 25 years in broadcast audio and video production. Our passionate team creates content and marketing for the world of Internet talk radio. If you've got a passion, come join us at BBMGlobalNetwork.com. The BBM Global Network. Your voice is now heard. Innovative Dementia Care with your host, Susan Kohler, licensed and certified speech language pathologist and author of How to Communicate with Alzheimer's, Susan Kohler is here to help you, the caregiver. Learn about the communication process and useful techniques that will create a meaningful connection with you and your loved ones. So now, welcome the host of Innovative Dementia Care, Susan Kohler. Hey, welcome everyone. I am Susan Kohler. You're listening to Innovative Dementia Care on BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. I'd like to thank you all for joining me today. And as I always do before we get started into what we want to talk about and discuss and cover and share today, I want to thank you again, those of you who are writing in and contacting me with what areas you'd like to have covered what topics are important to you and how it's affecting your caregiving uh, duties and how it's helping you and what areas you would love resources on. And the way to do that, to keep that line of communication open, as we say, is to go to Susan at Susan Kohler dot com, Susan at Susan Kohler K-O-H-L-E-R dot com. And you can certainly uh, share your thoughts with me. And many of you ask how to listen to the programs that have already been broadcast. Please go to bbmglobalnetwork.com and look for me, Susan Kohler, Innovative Dementia Care. Click on that icon and then you'll see when you get to the page a little uh, uh, button that says read more. And when you click on that... You will be able to, at the bottom of the page, see where all of the programs have been archived. All right. And there'll be a little title about what each one is about. So we always like to get that business out of the way. Again, please, please, I I, I can't uh, stress enough that I want this program to be for you and the things that will help you with your caregiving duties, with the quality time you get with your loved one, and using what we promote here on this program to create positive opportunities for exchanges to engage and to have what we call just that wonderful emotional connection with anything you're doing together and also to bring in anybody else in your family or your friends or professionals that you're hiring or even uh, professionals like when you go to the physician, uh, certain appointments you have at the doctors, any other uh Procedures you may have to uh, undertake, all of these things, bringing everybody in on the same page. When they see how you uh, relate to your loved one, they will model that. When you encourage them to do it too, they will see the benefits of that. They will be able to get just a better understanding of where that person is and how they can help, how they can be present for them, and how then we can bring quality uh exchanges that promote safety and cooperation with care. So again, at the beginning of every show, I always mention how I think it's so important to review the strategies and I'm getting faster and faster at them every week because those of you who are saying it helps to have that review because what I want you to do is think about your week, think about moments you had with someone, even in exchange perhaps in the 
in the in the line to get your latte in the morning? Did you have an exchange with someone and are aware of the communication process? We have to be aware of what's going on between ourselves and someone else in order to create an emotional connection, in order to help the person that we are uh, engaging to feel comfortable with us, to respond to us. And this happens all day long, not just with a person who is living with dementia and who we may uh, uh, be involved with in caregiving. So we're going to review those strategies. So welcome again to our revolution. This is one of the few places you're going to hear what needs to come first and foremost in caregiving is the importance of good communication practices when you're caring for someone who's living with dementia. That's because I believe and what I teach and what I promote is that the foundation of care begins with good communication practices. Once you create an emotional connection using good communication practices, you will have that person feeling secure, and as a result, you will get safety and cooperation with care. This is because dementia and other related medical conditions that will impair thought and mental abilities, this will impair communication. This will impair the way a person can react to their environment. They may not be able to tell you exactly how they feel, what they're experiencing, And as a result, the environment can get overwhelming and they may act out whether that's verbally or non-verbally. This is definitely a challenge. It's a challenge if we're just trying to insist on our agenda and push through with what we came to do for that person, as opposed to really looking at them, determining what are the unmet needs at this moment for this person living with dementia and as a caregiver. How can I discover what they're trying to tell me? How can I then take what I am doing and be there and present for them and provide the security they need to respond to me in the best way that they can? And how do I then affirm it? How do I then begin my task? Do I change my agenda? All of these things, if you're looking at the communication process, you will be able to understand then how to create safety and cooperation with care. As many of you know, I mention this a lot, it's very well documented in the literature. Caregivers report that the biggest burden in caring for someone is the breakdown in communication. So doesn't it make sense then that we need to look at the communication process, which is how we come forward, which is what they're giving to us, which is how we need to understand to relate to them that they feel that they can respond and they feel comfortable responding. They feel affirmed for responding. We keep the lines of communication open. So it, is something that as we review the strategies, which we will do in just a minute here, when we're reviewing the strategies, think back, did you, you know, employ these strategies throughout the week, throughout the, you know, the, the days and weeks that, that have, uh, that you, that you've been providing care and are you aware of what's happening with that person's responses? What things in the environment help that? What things you do help that? And when you need to look and see, when you need to adjust or be very flexible or come back to the very first strategy that we talk about to make sure you get that a good connection happening, all of this will happen if you're aware of the communication process, which is what the nine communication strategies that I teach will help you do. And, and But they're They're communication strategies that you have to practice. You just don't read it once and go, there, I've got it. You've got to be able to be aware on some level of what you're doing that will impact the reaction of another person. That is what the communication strategies will help you do. Many people tell me that as soon as they start to employ that very first strategy, which we're going to get to in just a moment – 
they already see a change in what's happening in the communication process. I love that. That's exactly what I want to hear. And I want you to keep trying and keep uh, honing your skills as a good communicator. All right. We're going to take a short break and then I am going to get through those strategies as a review to help you remember in your, your days of caregiving where you have been employing that successfully. Uh, I'm Susan Kohler. This is Innovative Dementia Care. You're listening on BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. Don't go away. We're going to be right back. If you're a person caring for someone living with dementia, then this program is for you. It's designed for families and friends coping with the challenges of caregiving. The foundation of care, Susan Kohler believes, is communication. Innovative Dementia Care with Susan Kohler provides strategies to keep the lines of communication open between you and your loved one, increase quality interactions, decrease the burden of daily care for you, the caregiver. Join Susan, 11 a.m. Eastern, on the BBM Global Network. Susan and her guests will share techniques so you can facilitate your loved one's ability to safely follow your instructions, participate in daily activities, and express daily wants and desires. To learn positive solutions, creative ideas, and practical strategies that will build a healthy foundation of care. Mike Zorick, a three-time California state champion in Greco-Roman wrestling at 114 pounds. Mike, blind since birth, was born in Hartford, Connecticut. He was a six-time national placer, including two seconds, two-thirds, and two-fourths. He also won the Veterans Folk Style Wrestling twice at 152 pounds. In all these tournaments, he was the only blind competitor. Nancy Zorick, a creative spirit, whose talents have taken her to the stage and into galleries and exhibitions in several states. Her father, a commercial artist who shared his instruments with his daughter and helped her fine-tune her natural abilities, influenced her decision to follow in his footsteps. Ms. Zorick has enjoyed a fruitful career doing what she loves. Listen Saturday mornings at 12 Eastern for The Nancy and Mike Show for heartwarming stories and interesting talk on the BBM Global Network. Hey, everyone. Everyone, we're back. This is Susan Kohler. You're listening to Innovative Dementia Care, and we're coming to you from BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. We uh, just had our little introduction where we reviewed how you can get in touch with me, Susan at SusanKohler.com, and where you can see on BBMGlobalNetwork.com, clicking on the icon of my program, Innovative Dementia Care with Susan Kohler, to get any archive programs that we have already broadcast. So let's review the strategies. Here we go. There are nine strategies. As I always mention, the first strategy is the most important. If you do nothing else but focus on the first strategy, you are going to learn so much about the communication process. You will be able to see what's happening with someone that you're trying to communicate with. And the beauty of this is you'll be able to learn so much about what's happening with communication, not just with someone who may have dementia or some kind of related medical issue that impairs their ability to communicate and relate to you without your facilitation. But you will also understand what's going on in any communication uh, exchange. And you will find out all day long that if you keep these strategies at the forefront of your mind, you're going to learn what's happening with two human beings when they try to connect. And really, in my opinion, that's what we're here for. We're here on this earth to make meaningful connections with one another. So it's very important that we look and see how we truly and honestly communicate with one another, that we make a connection. And as we, uh, the, People that I work with and uh, in my research that I do with uh, public affairs department at UCLA, we talk about the emotional connection. It's the emotional connection because that's really what it is. And it's the interaction of two human spirits. Okay. So strategy number one, first and foremost is get their attention. Why is that so important? Get their attention. This is because 
in order to make a connection with someone, you have to first be able to get their attention. They cannot just turn and shift to you in a very quick way or uh, a way that just lets them be right there present with you. They can't do that. We have many things going on with someone who is living with a condition like dementia. We have usually aging involved, vision and hearing are not as good. Just all of the processes that go on with someone are starting to slow down. So therefore, what happens in this very first strategy, we have to pay attention to what's what we're doing and what the environment is doing and presenting to this person. This person needs to be able to shift the focus onto what stimuli is coming. They need that help. They need that direction. Otherwise, the environment is overwhelming to them. There's just all these things going on, and they cannot process what's happening. So the frontal lobe is responsible. It's very vulnerable in conditions like dementia, and it will impair our ability to connect and communicate that it helps us the frontal lobe will help us process the environment and then it helps regulate our behaviors because we're starting to process the environment and therefore it will uh, it will educate our decisions on how to respond. That's how we relate to one another. Now this happens uh, kind of quickly or maybe even in a lot of people impulsively uh, who, who are not dealing with an issue like dementia. But for someone with dementia or a condition that's similar to that, it's really slowed down. We've got to give it time to warm up. We've got to give it time to be able to be present and then feel security. And then that connection will be made. Many uh, professional caregivers, particularly nurses' assistants, when I teach these uh, strategies and they start to use just strategy number one, they tell me that as they're trying to be present with that person and thinking about strategy number one and the techniques that are used, they they can see it in someone's eyes, their expression, their face, when they're ready, when they've got the connection. They say, that's when I know I can go forward and begin the task that I have. So think about that. If you do anything, go back and look how you do your approaches. Strategy number one, you approach someone with some kind of greeting or overture. You just start with that. You don't start right in with what you want to do. That's technique number one. Number two is to be right there in front of them. They may not hear or see as well. They can't process you if they can't have an opportunity to take you in. The best way to do that is to be in front. They will sense the warmth. They will sense the positive nature of you that you're ready to be there for them. Number three, you make eye contact. You don't need to stare at someone, but you need to look at their face because you'll get a lot by learning to listen with your eyes as well as your ears. What are they doing? What are they saying? How do they seem to you? And then the next strategy, uh, excuse me, the next technique is to simply wait. You can't rush an encounter. You wait to see how they respond. And if there is a response, affirm it. And then see where you can, you know, the whole time, if you're then going to begin something, whether it's just a verbal exchange or whether it's actually a a chore you need to do with that person, pay attention because you may have to redirect that it, what what they're doing with you. you you've, you've had some time here to get their attention, and it might fade. They might get distracted. So we always talk about in technique number five, direct and redirect that attention as often as you need. So I hope that's a, uh, a good review of that one because it's the most important. I still insist on spending a little more time on it. Strategy number two then comes into making sure that you use a calm tone of voice. People will match your voice. You start to shout and, you you know, if you're yelling or if you're loud, they're going to match that. And also your energies in your body are going to have that heightened um, energy as well, which may not be uh, beneficial. So think about a calm tone of voice that will also inform your body. So your voice is calm, your body is calm. So what you're presenting to the person in your care is calm. And they will they will feel much better about that than something that's a little more edgy. So watch your voice. 
Watch your language. That's strategy number three. It's very important to use positive, friendly statements, concrete words, simple phrases. I want you to make sure that you're always thinking about what you're saying and how you're saying it. It's so easy to be negative. We've got to watch and be positive. All right, that's strategy one, two, and three. We're going to keep going with the review of the strategies, but we will be right back in just a moment. I'm Susan Kohler. You're listening to Innovative Dementia Care on BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. Stay with us. Did you know that your beliefs create your entire reality, but it's the subconscious beliefs that do most of the creating? Belief Shifter and Life Coach Shiraz can help you identify those limiting beliefs and eliminate them, often in a single session. Like it was almost instant, like I had relief right away. Creating better health, relationships, careers, and finances. Let Shiraz help you step out of safety and into awareness. Definitely something's happening. Uh, it's like a, a flow inside. You know, it feels good. Whether in person or online, Shiraz provides personal coaching, belief shifting. Visit Shiraz at energeticmagic.com or call 416-529-7429. Energetic Magic on the BBM Global Network, Tuesdays at 7 p.m. Eastern. Find your greater happiness. Be well, be aware, be magical. There are artists and then there's Alice Asmar. This award-winning artist has spent her entire life devoted to her artistic pursuits and has had a lifelong fascination with American Indians of the southwestern United States. Her book, Dance to the Great Spirit, showcases her drawings and paintings inspired by sacred rituals of the Pueblo Indians, and four of her lithographs are in permanent collection at the National Museum of American History in the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. She is one of four artists in the United States to win a Woolley Fellowship for study in Paris at Les Colles Beaux-Arts and has been featured in numerous publications. She's exhibited at the world's most prestigious museums and galleries and recently won a 20-year service award from the Burbank City Council and the inaugural art competition of the Foundation of the United States in Paris. Visit www.asmarart.com, www.aliceasmarinternational.com and email alice at aliceasmar at aol.com. Hey, everyone. We are back. I'm Susan Kohler. You're listening to Innovative Dementia Care on BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. We reviewed strategy number one, get their attention, why that's so important to be in an overture and an ability to help that person relate to you, feel secure, where you'll get safety and cooperation with care. Make the connection first with strategy number one. Strategy number two, Speak in a calm tone of voice. Strategy number three, watch your language. Make sure you make positive statements, positive overtures. That will always read as friendly and it make that person feel comfortable. It's so easy to be negative. Our negative thoughts are really sometimes are overwhelming. Got to watch and make sure we state things in a positive way. Strategy number four, use yes, no questions. I know there might be a few different uh, camps on this. I like yes, no questions or two choice questions because they help that person uh, be more successful. They're more likely to be able to answer when you give them two choices, which is yes or no and might be something as simple as what would you like? To, would you like a drink? Yes. Would you like coffee or tea? They hear those two words, one of them they will like or whatever impulse they have, they'll say one of them. That is a positive communication exchange. I believe when you simply ask an open-ended question that's too hard, remember we said that frontal lobe has to be warmed up to be able to make a decision just to respond. So the easier things are to, to answer, the more successful they will be. So think of using yes, no, or two choice questions. Strategy number five, repeat, rephrase, and repair. These may sound complicated, but they do take some practice uh, to make sure that you're always, in a way, repeating. Uh, it, it's a way of affirming what they're saying. If you rephrase it or even if you repair it, if there's something incorrect in a statement, you don't point it out. You simply say to them what they have said to you. They will hear that. They will know. They will feel positive. They will feel successful. And they will know they're being heard. So think about how you might repeat, 
rephrase and repair something that someone is saying to you. Perhaps it's really all nonverbal. Perhaps there's just some body language that's giving you an impression of something. Go ahead and think of that as a repeat, that you are affirming what what they're saying to you. You'll be able to then tell by their facial expression if you are having some success of understanding what they're giving to you. And then sometimes you play detective and try to figure this out. But if you don't get in there and try it and don't use these strategies, you won't see how helpful they will be. So keep practicing. Think about repeat, rephrase, and repair. And then strategy number six, orient and reorient frequently. This doesn't always mean to quiz them on the date. However, sometimes calendars are helpful. If someone uh, can benefit from seeing a calendar, sometimes that that's good. Uh, and calendars are helpful in caregiving. I tell people to go ahead and go. Don't worry. You know, of course, you've got things on your smartphone. But what about putting out a nice big calendar that you can lay out for you and for other Uh, people who are helping you in your caregiving efforts, family members, friends, and any other professional uh, help that you get. So everybody sees what's going on. If you, I think it's so much easier to look at an entire month, for example, so you know what's coming ahead because you have to keep organized as a caregiver. So aside from that, Orient, reorient just also means to the moment. What is happening at this moment? What is the task at hand? You're working with strategy number one to get their attention. You're making the connection. Then you've got to help them understand what's about to happen. And you need to do that each step of the way. Remember, I said the attention may not hold. That's why this strategy is called orient and reorient frequently. You do it as much as you need because they need that extra help of staying connected with you. Uh, I've had many, many stories where caregivers have told me they had a good connection. They started doing a daily uh, task, and all of a sudden that person just seemed like they lost that connection. They couldn't understand what was happening, and they got very anxious. And the caregivers tell me they go right back to strategy number one, get the connection again, and then reorient to what's happening. So think about that. You're always going to be orienting them to what's going on. That will keep them feeling secure in the environment, and they will then respond with you with cooperation. They will feel safe. They will respond. Now, strategy number seven. I always mention this because it is a strategy, and it simply says, use touch. There are ways appropriately to use touch that provide comfort, help raise the attention to what's going on, help redirect, help let that person know how they process their environment. You need to learn what is appropriate for the person in your care. There are some great connections people have where they can even reach out and give a great big hug. I'm not recommending that with everyone, but if that's appropriate and makes that person feel good, then think of that. That's a strategy. That is telling them everything's okay. I'm here for you. Even patting someone on the arm or even patting someone's armchair. They see that friendly gesture. That is what I'm talking about with use touch. It says I love you in many, many ways. So remember, think about how you might use touch as a strategy. Strategy number eight, learn to be a good listener. I can't emphasize this enough. This is where it kind of pulls in all the strategies, getting their attention, orienting them, using positive statements, being calm and positive before them. Think about how you've got to listen with your eyes as well as your ears to what they are saying, what they are giving you, whether it's verbal or nonverbal, even vocal. If it's something you don't understand, there is something being communicated all the time. Look at their body language. Look at their expression. You will learn so much if you will stop and listen. I charge you to try this even in your own conversations. Really stop and listen to your friends or your coworkers, your family members. We always keep this agenda in our heads about waiting to jump in and say what we want to say. 
let's listen first. So think about learn to be a good listener. And then strategy number nine is don't argue. I think that goes without saying don't argue. It just means you you can't confront. You can't try to negate what that person is giving you. You need to be positive to them and you might have to change your agenda. All right. That's a very important little point to leave. Let me let you think about that. Think about your strategies that you've been using all week. And we're going to take another short break. This is Susan Kohler. You're listening to Innovative Dementia Care. We're on BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. And we're going to come right back. Hold that thought. Dr. R.C. will share extraordinary resources and services that promote educational success, as well as making a difference in the lives of all social workers, as well as the lives of children, adolescents, and teens of today. She will have open discussions addressing many of the issues that we face about our youth and how being employed in the uniquely skilled profession of social work for over 18 years has taught invaluable lessons through her personal experiences. She will also provide real-life facts examples, and personal stories that will confirm that why serving as a child advocate is extremely beneficial when addressing the needs of the whole child. Listen live Saturdays, 10 a.m. Eastern on the BBM Global Network and tune in radio as Dr. R.C. will provide thought-provoking information that will empower, encourage, and strengthen students, families, and communities across our nation. You can also visit her at soarwithkatie.com. Introducing BetterHomeAndGarden.com. That's www.BetterHomeAndGarden.com with just the letter N in Better Home and Garden. BetterHomeAndGarden.com offers you the highest quality products on the market that are environmentally safe and effective and to make them available to you at the lowest possible prices. BetterHomeAndGarden.com understands that kind of creativity and do-it-yourself attitude. Thus, we developed our website, BetterHomeAndGarden.com. BetterHomeAndGarden.com offers you the following products right online. Bath, bedding, collectibles, craft, sewing and hobby, food and beverage, furniture, home decor, kitchen and dining, lamps and lighting, large appliances, musical instruments, outdoor cooking, patio items, pet supplies, plant and garden, rug and floor coverings, small appliances, travel and luggage, and so much more. Better Home and Garden is an online retailer offering a wide variety of high-quality brand name merchandise at discount prices. Our service is personal and we aim to please. Visit us at www.betterhomeandgarden.com. Make your home your own. Hey, everyone. I'm Susan Kohler. You're listening to Innovative Dementia Care on BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. Welcome back. We are wrapping up our review of the strategies, the nine communication strategies I teach that promote safety and cooperation with care because I believe the foundation of care begins with good communication practices. And when you are aware of the communication process, you will see a change in how that person will relate to you. You will also be able to model that for other people uh, who are helping you, who are part of the team that takes the circle of, of, of friends and family who help take care of that person. You will see a lot of difference. You will see the ability to make positive quality exchanges and both of you will feel so much better. Wouldn't that relieve a lot of the caregiver burden? It's just simply putting into practice how to communicate. All right. Now, the other way that we keep our, uh, I want to say stress level down. One of the ways we did talk about breathing, which I've heard from some of you like to review that again, which we will in future dates. But we also have been looking at how we get organized as a caregiver, how important that is. We have to take our days and weeks. That's why I mentioned previously about getting a uh, big calendar. So you write it all out. So you see what's happening. You see what's going on. It's a a good way to take a look at your days and weeks and even months because there's always things going on. Uh, The time of this broadcast is is the fall where we're going to get into a lot of holidays. There's a lot of things we want to make sure sure that we're on top of. So think about a routine. Think about making that consistent because that will help that person in your care. Think about what things will become recognizable to that person. And in organizing yourself as a caregiver while you're working on that routine, making sure that all of your 
paperwork is in place. In other words, we talked about having a uh, place where medical history, phone numbers, contact information, all of these things are written down, whether they're in your computer, in your smartphone, but also hard copies for uh, people that may be helping you in terms of taking care of this person. Uh, Sometimes they call it the refrigerator list. I used to call it the tote bag uh, contents in the tote bag we had by our door was all the information for my father so that no matter what was going on it was right there if we had to uh, refer to it and if we had to go anywhere the tote bag just came right with us and it was so much easier uh, a lot of the nursing profession when I would go in with the tote bag and handed them uh, particular items from that tote bag they were so grateful they said this is so helpful so Keep that in mind. What can you do to be organized as a caregiver? Now, the other thing we started talking about recently in terms of organizing based on some of your emails that I'm getting is being organized also means taking care of meals, right? Now, we talked about, we started talking about how we want to do little snacks and always keep them in the refrigerator or keep them in a way that you have a little bag again maybe another little tote or maybe just a section in that tote bag where you can keep some snacks on hand particularly if someone has a medical issue where it's good that they do have some things throughout the day or if they say to you they're hungry or if you know that's something they like will help uh, help make them feel you know there's always everything Many things are comfort foods to all of us. We want to find those out, uh, explore what those might be, and and if it's something portable, have those on hand. We are going to talk a little more about shopping, how to go up and down the grocery aisles to find the good things. We'll, We'll keep that going. But one of the things I want to start today, now that we've gone through the uh the strategies, and I hope you were thinking through your week how you were using those strategies and how they were helping you and what things you want to tweak in terms of those strategies, what you want to pay attention to, and then look at your daily schedule as we are being organized as a caregiver, how that routine is influencing your overtures with that person and how they're responding to the routine. Now let's talk a little more about dietary considerations with food preparation with the right textures and consistencies. We're going to talk, uh, we're going to spend a little time on this so that we're really, uh, when I work at the hospitals, I'm surprised how people, uh, they're just trying to think of ways perhaps to let somebody eat, but they're not looking at how they can adjust uh, and provide some things that are easier for that person to consume and how they can help that person eat safely as well. So we're going to review this. And those of you who have my book, How to Communicate with Alzheimer's, which you can find at susankohler.com, susan, K-O-H-L-E-R.com. If you go to that site, click on the icon of the book, And then you can browse through and see if it's something that's helpful to you. But those of you who have the book, who a lot of you tell me you have the book and you keep it open as we work each week, go to page 132. 132 has a little more... uh, a little more of uh, going in depth of what's helpful when you're thinking about food preparation for someone that you are taking care of and for yourself. Think about... We're all aging, right? There are things that happen when we're aging. There are things that happen with our ability to chew and swallow. So we have to look at that as well as what's happening cognitively with someone who has a dementia or some related issue where they've got to attend and pay attention and safely be able to take in what we give them. So sometimes getting them to eat enough and consume their food safely can be difficult. So here are some things to think about. The goal with eating is for good nutrition and hydration and a way to take medications safely. Think about those three things, nutrition, hydration, and a way to take medications safely. This is so important You need to be nourished. You need to be hydrated. You won't fight 
you know, any infections or any other um, medical issues that may be arising if there's not a good solid base of nutrition and, of course, for hydration. All right. So that's the introduction to this. I hope this will be helpful to you. If you want to go get a piece of paper and a pencil so you can write down some of these notions we're going to talk about right after this next break. I'm Susan Kohler. You're listening to Innovative Dementia Care. We're on BBM Global Network and tune in radio stay with us attorney renee marie smith is changing the way we sell real estate she wrote a series of books called my short sale guru guides for all real estate practitioners whether you're a homeowner wanting to understand the process an agent who has been handling short sales for years or an industry analyst wanting to know how short sales impact your business renee uses her vast real estate experience to take a comprehensive look at the recent market phenomena while relaying it in an easy to understand format through her company smith title services renee has counseled thousands of short sale participants and processed in excess of a thousand short sales her knowledge is transformational for real estate professionals and laymen alike and her live presentations provide people the opportunity to ask specific questions about their issues buy her books and schedule her to speak at your next event visit www.smithtitleservices.com or call 305-705-3428 or email her at renee at smithtitleservices.com isn't it time to sell your property to Today, learn the My Short Sale Guru way. The opiate epidemic has reached crisis levels, and with so many families affected by addiction, opiate related drug overdoses, and death, the time is now to have a real constructive conversation about addiction that could lead to better prevention, treatment, and recovery. Alan Charles, author and keynote speaker on drug abuse and prevention, presents The Alan Charles Show. Alan brings a message of hope, sharing his unbelievable story of surviving a 24 year addiction to cocaine and and highlights from his memoir, Walking Out the Other Side, an addict's journey from loneliness to life. His raw honesty and courageous heart breaks the stigma of addiction and offers a unique perspective into the mind of an addict. Join Alan each week as he brings his listeners to a true understanding of the grip of addiction. It is only with this understanding that we can begin to heal. The Alan Charles Show, Thursdays at 9 p.m. Eastern on the BBM Global Network. Hey, everyone. We are back. I'm Susan Kohler. You're listening to Innovative Dementia Care on BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. This is a program that puts at the forefront the importance of good communication practices and caring for someone who's living with dementia. And we have reviewed those strategies that help us to understand the communication process and what is happening with dementia, how we facilitate communication to make a good, safe connection. And then we get that person feeling secure and cooperate with our care. Your feedback is so important to me. And I appreciate how much those of you have sent me emails. I do my best to get back to as many of them as I can, but I do try to address what your thoughts are in those emails during each week in the program. So thank you so much for that. And so many of you tell me that as soon as you employ the communication strategies that you've learned, particularly people at my workshop uh, who take my workshops because they are doing them firsthand, you get a communication partner and you try all these things out, that once they leave the workshop and they try it with someone in their care, the difference in the connection is they see it right away. So don't be afraid to try to communicate and use the strategies. All right. We have been talking about now dietary considerations. We mentioned right before the break, the whole idea of eating well is to get nutrition, hydration, and a way to take medication. They are crucial to keeping our body in balance, to have good health, to fight off infections, to um, not let signs and symptoms manifest. The body does better when it's nourished, hydrated, and <clears throat> excuse me, can take the medication needed <clears throat> in order, excuse me, I'm just going to take a second here, <clears throat> in order to uh, be healthy, not let medical conditions become uh, a problem and which if we can pay attention to what is going on in terms of medical issues, we will notice that uh, we will make adjustments. We will get them to the doctor sooner. We will be able to keep them from having to get to a point where things become very critical and 
therefore, uh, sometimes, unfortunately, they end up in the hospital, which we don't want. So we're going to look at how nutrition, hydration, and a way to get good medication safely help us keep a person at their best. Now, one of the, this is going to seem, I want you to, if you've got that piece of paper and that pencil, I want you to mark down a few things. See how this might help the person in your care. The very first thing that I promote in terms of good nutrition and eating well, eating safely, the person must be 90 degrees upright. This probably sounds so simple, but there are a lot of people, particularly if they're maybe still in bed or if they're in a chair that leans back, you're at risk if you're not 90 degrees upright. You're meant to eat and that swallow to protect your airway as you're chewing and swallowing and drinking. You've got to have your head straight, and there might be a slight tilt forward. It's just the way the head, that's kind of the neutral position for eating safely. We have people who are getting weaker and older. We have other medical issues. We've got to look at if we have them in a safe position. So as simple as that sounds, if you can still have that person up and in the chair in the dining room or a particular place you'd like to eat and have uh, uh, mealtime together, have them 90 degrees upright. Think about that. If you have to compromise uh, not being able to be in a chair but in something else, you've got to look at pillows and ways to support a person in a safe position. Look at the position of the torso and the head and neck. Make sure they're in a safe position. The next thing, think about this. Offer meals in a quiet environment. Anything that's distracting to someone, and we've all had all had things where we feel like, uh, to put it simply, food going down the wrong way, you have to look and see if you were distracted. Things happen in restaurants because they're noisy and distracting. So it's that's why it's important. Think about where you can offer meals or snacks and the environment is quiet. So mark that down if that's an issue for the person in your care. Here's one, and the next point, that... People don't think about, uh, sometimes even in institutions like in a nursing home, they put everything out on a tray and it looks overwhelming. There's so much that looks that it looks like they have to eat. You, you've you got this plate, you've got other little uh, items, you've got liquids, on. all these things are on your tray or all these things are in front of you. Sometimes it's good to just eliminate what I call the clutter and just offer one item at a time. Work on one thing at a time. You don't have to have these large portions and all of these items. I know sometimes people put all these items out hoping that there'll be something on that in those offerings that they'll want. If I put them all out, we'll find out which ones work. But you're better off if you just don't overwhelm them visually and just let them look at one or two items at a time. Mark that down if you think that might be something to try. So here's the next thing I want to talk about is then how we look at certain foods. Foods like meat can be very tough and they can be very dry. And we want to look at how we're preparing those items so that they are not uh, so difficult to chew Here's the deal. You need to break down the food in your mouth. Swallowing pieces whole without starting to digest them and the digestive enzymes that you need when you're eating, they're in your saliva. They're not down in your stomach. The stomach's just a grinder. So think about this. You want people to be able to break down food easily in their mouth so the digestive enzymes can be there And they are mixed in with the person while they're preparing that bite of food that you gave them or that that they took and it's in their mouth. That way, when it goes through the rest of their digestive process, it's much more easily to it's much more easily broken down. And it's also much more comfortable. It's safer. It's more nutritious, et cetera, et cetera. So think about how they're able to manage things like meat that get a little hard and tougher and it's just hard to begin with. They t- you know, it's, it's, it's work to break down meat. So even when we're not looking at someone who's older and who may have a dementia or a related issue. So you've got to figure out how to either chop it up finely or maybe even ground meats. 
those will be also more moist so that you'll be able to have that person be able to manage that more safely. So we're going to talk about how to make those things moister and softer and safer in just a second. We're going to continue with this discussion, but we need another short break. I'm Susan Kohler. You're listening to Innovative Dementia Care. Coming to you from BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. Stay with us. We're going to be right back. If you're a person caring for someone living with dementia, then this program is for you. It's designed for families and friends coping with the challenges of caregiving. The foundation of care, Susan Kohler believes, is communication. Innovative Dementia Care with Susan Kohler provides strategies to keep the lines of communication open between you and your loved one, increase quality interactions, decrease the burden of daily care for you, the caregiver. Join Susan, 11 a.m. Eastern, on the BBM Global Network. Susan and her guests will share techniques so you can facilitate your loved one's ability to safely follow your instructions, participate in daily activities, and express daily wants and desires. To learn positive solutions, creative ideas, and practical strategies that will build a healthy foundation of care. French Rastafarian baker Chef Hugues Mott is a fourth-generation baker and has worked in 11 countries across three continents. Born in Mulhouse, France, he began apprenticing in his father's bakery at age 12 and has devoted his life to learning cultures of the world from inside kitchens across the globe. He also teaches traditional French baking by hosting demonstrations and classes, and his passion for baking is reflected in his delicious confections. With a deep respect for discipline and his Rastafarian way of life, Chef Uvmat exemplifies commitment to tradition and culture in a global world. Traveling extensively and combining a myriad of flavors into his recipes, Chef Uvmat brings a unique approach to baking. To read more about the French Rastafarian baker, visit www.frenchchefoug.com. That's H-U-G-U-E-S. Bon appétit and bless up. Hey, everyone, we're back. I'm Susan Kohler. You're listening to Innovative Dementia Care, coming to you from BBM, Global Network, and TuneIn Radio. I'm so happy that you are uh, listening today. I hope it's been helpful to review the strategies as we did. We started to talk about, again, how to get organized as a caregiver, the things that we can do to keep ourselves in check with our calendar, our daily routine, what makes the routine comfortable for the person in your care, how to keep all that vital information handy. As I said, some people call it the refrigerator list. I have a tote bag list that I, I always kept, kept at the front door. Uh, when we were taking care of my father. So it's important to get yourself organized. Other parts of being organized include things like making sure we can help this person with good nutrition, hydration, and a way to take medication safely. So we talked about issues with food right now. And we just to recap real quick, because we just started to get into this in detail, which we're going to continue next week is the idea that you only serve somebody food when they're 90 degrees upright. You have to look at their posturing. You have to make them safe in a position that you think about the environment. It should be very relatively quiet, and that's that's a safer way to attend to what you're doing and paying attention to how you're eating, that we can eliminate the clutter. We can only put out maybe one or two items at a time. We don't need to put out an entire plate with large portions and all other kinds of things, it's it's a little overwhelming. And right away, that person won't even know where to begin. So if you just do one item and you help them get started, if they're still able to feed themselves, you can begin with one or two items, whatever works for you, try that out. And then we talked about how things like meats are going to get more difficult to chew, break down, and then be safely Uh, swallowed and safely broken down with the rest of our digestive uh, system. So you might have to chop it up very finely. You might have to make it make it ground, which makes it very moist. And another thing to do about the meats or, or any kind of item like that, think about meatloaf. That's a great uh, softer option to a tough meat. And also you can moisten meats with gravy and broth. I always think about that. How can I best make the food 
more easily broken down. And if there's more uh, liquid like or something a little more like that with it, like gravy or broth, that's going to help break down with the saliva when that person is chewing that. Okay, we're going to continue on with these kind of items because at some point, maybe someone can't really even chew well, or maybe there's a condition with the dentition in their mouth. We're going to take a look at all that. Okay, so we're going to continue on dietary considerations as the weeks go on. Please make sure that you are in touch with me, Susan at SusanKohler.com. Tell me what's helpful. We're going to also work into more meal preparation, going to the grocery store, what things to buy, what things to look for, what aisles to go down. We've got lots of things to share with you. I have a dietitian who's going to be on uh, in, the, in the weeks to come who's going to help us kind of navigate through those kinds of uh, questions. Please send me your comments, your questions, and what things you need covered. This program is for you. Remember, what keeps people vital is the emotional connection they have with other human beings. Communication is essential to living. Communication is our verbal and nonverbal behaviors that will signal our intent and purpose in reaching out to others for basic needs and comfort, desires and information. If that ability becomes impaired, confusion can overwhelm that person we're caring for and it will overwhelm us, the caregiver. That's why it's so important to use good communication practices in your care and all of your efforts. If you are thinking about the communication process as the foundation for that care, you will find so much value in understanding what is happening for that person, where they are, and how you can reach out to them, connect with them, and then continue your caregiving efforts. All right, everyone, I'm so glad to have this time with you. Please remember to Reach out if you have questions, if you have concerns, if you have topics you want covered, I'm here. Susan at SusanKohler.com. Thank you so much. I'm Susan Kohler. You're listening to Innovative Dementia Care on BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. We'll be here next week. Everyone be well. You have been listening to Innovative Dementia Care with your host, Susan Kohler. For creative activities, solutions, and sensible strategies to help caregivers build a healthy foundation of care for your loved ones. Listen each week right here on Susan Kohler's Innovative Dementia Care. You've been listening to the BBM Global Network. The ideas, views, and opinions of this broadcast are those of the participants of the program and are not necessarily the ideas, views, and opinions of the BBM Global Network Company.